Thank you. It's nice to be here. Sorry to disappoint those who wanted to hear Simeon. Hopefully you will get your chance later. Uh, well, I guess I should start by uh, congratulating Samson and I have known him for many, many years. Uh, and actually we are very lucky people because sort of professionally we are surrounded by lots of smart people uh, from whom we learn lots of lots of things. If you think from other side about your interactions with people whom you knew for many years, you realize that beyond kind of narrow technical aspect of it, there aren't very many memorable things they have said. And this is definitely not the case about Samson. I'm sure everyone can kind of remember funny, idiosyncratic, surprising things coming out of him. Moreover, it's a completely different category. He also somehow provides quotable things, you know. So I'll, I'll share one Samsonism, not because it's the best or most characteristic, because it's personal, and because also of some sort of guilt feeling. I have been plagiarizing it for more than 15 years, pretty much during any collaboration I had for those years, and most likely I will continue doing so for as long as I do find collaborators. So years ago we were writing a paper with Pierre and Samson, and uh, it was coming to the end. Somehow I volunteered, or I was volunteered, to have a first go at the conclusion, which I was doing, and either there was something I had to run away, or I just simply ran out of steam. So comes the last sentence, wasn't sure what to write, so I wrote something which sounded along those lines, and finally some of the authors are more skeptical than others about blah blah blah. So I sent the file out, Two days later, I get, this was before Dropbox, I get a file from Samson, I go through the pages, seemingly no, no, nothing has changed, and then I reach the very, very end, and there it comes, a new paragraph, which was just one line, written in boldface, possibly in all capitals. And it said, the authors shall agree. So, <laughs> and this is the one I've been using ever since, and my birthday wish for Samson is that he will continue finding people who will sort of continue agreeing with him <laughs> while preserving all of his idiosyncrasies, originality, and other things which make Samson Samson. All right. And now I'll talk about anomalies and inflow mechanism into which and descent, notably to which uh, Samson had as much contribution as any other person. So it's a work with a very nice set of people, Ibuba, Federico Bonetti, and Emily Nardoni. And uh, I am sorry there are no credits on the transparencies otherwise, but I will be happy to provide references. And this is a talk which is kind of very much, if not by the goal, but by kind of original point connected to, to Kumbrun's talk. So, uh, anomalies. I realize the audience is mixed, so I will start from the very, very beginning. And the very beginning is the 11-dimensional supergravity, which was mentioned already. So this is the theory in highest dimension with highest amount of supersymmetries. Uh, once you know the, the field content, actually the probably most remarkable thing about this theory is that it exists, or that the, this action has been constructed but otherwise it looks fairly innocuous, you know. Hilbert Einstein term, kinetic term, the usual fermionic terms. So the, actually the next most interesting thing about it is this triple coupling, let's call it Chern-Simons, uh, and this is pretty much anything I am going to tell is one way or another uh, traces to, to this, this particular coupling. And of course in the supersymmetric, in just supergravity, I mean this field, the G field strength is just simply taken to be the field strength of the three-form potential. 
So we have local symmetries. There is a bare potential appearing in, in here. But uh, nevertheless, there is a symmetry under C goes to C plus lambda. So there is some kind of gauge transformation. Okay. Now, one other old thing which we knew for many, many years about this, this theory is that it admits ADS7 vacuum. And so there is a, a four form. And if there is a flux of this four form field strength, through S4, then somehow there is a stable, maximally supersymmetric solution, which displays SO5 symmetry, which is, of course, directly related to the isometries of the sphere. OK, now I'm not sure how far I will manage to get in my talk. Uh, so the, 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 the sort of ostensibly what I was planning to talk about was about kind of a program of, uh, let's say, systematic geometric derivation of anomalies in four and possibly two-dimensional theories starting from, from M theory five brain. Okay, so there has been a lot of progress um, and there is a continuous progress. Um, lots of, and anomalies provide a nice robust information. So this is, I mean, there are lots of theories uh, in four dimensions without, for example, Lagrangian description and things like that. Um, the anomalies, okay, they have been, some of the, the, the results have been derived by field theoretic uh, methods, but it would, we felt it would be nice to have some kind of top-down approach. And the classes of geometries which would appear here, which you could kind of, I mean, again, we know that ADS, the boundary of ADS, there is some theory living there. And if we talk about ADS5, then we will be talking about four-dimensional superconformal theories. And the two large classes of solutions that, that one can consider this way are the following. So either we kind of take this ADS7 roughly and, uh, and embed a, a Riemann surface there, and then this way we will get to ADS5, and this is a more brainy uh, picture for string theorists. Uh, and this way we can get theories with 8 or 16 supercharges in the bulk. So respectively n equal 1 or n equal 2 in the in four dimensions. Or there is another way of doing it is if you consider uh, a solutions which involve non-compact seven manifolds, compact I mean, and Minkowski 4, in such a way that there are some sort of, that the solution is conical and it involves fluxes and such solutions do exist, then we can find kind of an ADS limit to those. Um, and this is a rather large class of solutions. And in many of these, in this class, we don't even have brain realizations. So we cannot really talk about five brain wrapping this or that, or we don't know it in, in detail. Okay, but I'll, again, hopefully I'll have some time at least to, to comment on, on those. So for the moment, what I, my first thing to do is, as I said, everything is going to be about this CGG, but I'm going to, to add another counterpart to it. And the counterpart is of this form, C wedge X8, where X8 is some curvature polynomial, an eight form, it's an eight derivative term. Uh, the, pr the exact, the concrete form of the polynomial is, is written here. It's just some combination of uh, P1 square Petragian classes, P1 square and, and P2. This guy appears, okay, not directly in 11 dimensions. It is computable in string theory in 10 dimensions in type 2a string. It's just a result of some five point function calculation in, um, in 10 dimensions with one B field and four gravitons, and it can be lifted to 11 dimensions. Uh, this X8 is kind of a remarkable polynomial. It, uh, it seems to have a feature of sort of showing up in lots of not necessarily, not immediately same contexts. Okay, the way we see it in, in, in string theory is actually sort of a product. It, the way it comes out is a product of four gamma two matrices, and one finds uh, a following expression, which is actually relating this X8 to, to a L'Oreal number 
on any manifold, which on any eight manifold, which admits nowhere vanishing spinners. So this is something which has been used very, very much in, 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 in string theory. Okay? But one way or another, we, we add this guy to 11 dimensional supergravity, and this is the kind of the beginning of M theory. Okay? This is how M, M theory starts becoming, or 11 dimensional supergravity starts becoming an M theory. Once more, notice that because x8 is closed, we do keep our gauge invariance. C can be shifted by, by some closed form. Uh, all right. Uh, now we will talk about five brains. So uh, there are objects in this theory, They're kind of solitonic. The first goal is you can try to find them as, as classical solutions. But OK, why first the nomenclature? It's called a five brain because, I mean, what, what it does, it provides a, a source to this four form flux. So if we write some kind of five form delta function, which means it's an object that when you integrate anything wedge this in 11 dimensions, it will be putting you on this transverse six dimensional space time. And that's the nomenclature. You know, membrane is three dimensions, so five brain will be extended to one time and five uh, transverse dimensions. Okay? Now, if you do a zero mode expansion of this guy, you just try to determine spectrum what lives on this theory, then you find that what, what this theory supports is actually a supersymmetric six dimensional multiplet with 16 supercharges, and the multiplet is in question is a tensor multiplet. So the field content is given by a, a B menu, a tensor field. However, its field strength is constrained and it is self-dual. Okay? And then there are fermions and there are five scalars which parameterize the five transverse directions. This multiplet has an SO5 R symmetry. And again, uh, there are just five scalars which are in the fundamental of SO5 and the fermions live in the spinner representation of SO5. And what we know is, in principle, we don't know much about the non-abelian theory, but in principle, it does admit ADE classification, so there exist kind of non-abelian brains. Okay? And this is still a like kind of a direct description of this, is still rather mysterious. Okay, now let's start moving gently towards kind of inflow. Okay? Who is flowing into what? So first, uh, we will have inflow without anomalies. So I kept saying that this theory okay, is symmetric in absence of the brain under C goes to C plus D lambda and the, the space-time diffeomorphisms. So let's look at this gauge invariance. Okay, you, you compute this. And now remember, I mean, okay, C goes to C plus D lambda, you do some integration by part. When D hits G, now you will have a delta, and then you end up with something which lives on W5, on the world volume. So what 5-brain does, it breaks the gauge invariance of the bulk of the 11-dimensional theory. But it's not a big deal because we can, we can fix it by having a coupling of the tensor field. This little h3 is the field strength of this, this beta written here. So we can fix this by writing some couplings between the fields which live on the brain with pullback of the fields which live on the, in the bulk. Okay? But the moral is, the, something that you have to retain, is that the bulk and the brain are not separately gauge invariant anymore. So there are some symmetries. The overall symmetry is preserved, but it works in a combined way. You have to have the full system and the things are not separately symmetric. Okay? Now we can look at diffeomorphisms. Okay, so this was simple. There is no anomaly. All I have been doing was just simply classical variation. Okay, just checking the classical invariance. So again, similarly, I can take this coupling C wedge X8 uh, and also look at its variation. So I'll integrate by parts and rather write it as G wedge x7, where x7 is just some local object whose derivative is x8, 
So here we start getting into descent. Um, and then this X7 is no longer gauge invariant or diffeomorphism invariant. And so if you do this, I mean, you will end up again sooner or later hitting this G with the delta, with the derivative that will give you this delta phi form. So you will end up with some object uh, which is pulled back to the world volume and formally it looks like gravitational anomaly. Once more, I've been, I looked at some coupling and I just did classical variation of it, okay? I'm just studying the variation of it under diffeomorphisms. Uh, but this is, this is good. Why is it good? Because, because the theory on the brain, as I showed, it's a chiral theory and you can actually check that it is anomalous. So, you just check what lives on this brain, world volume, there is a chiral two form and we know it's anomaly which is given by Hirzelbruch polynomial and then there are the, the world volume fermions uh, and if we compute this total anomaly in the case of trivial normal bundle, I mean we get exactly the same combination of P1 square and P2 which I was showing. So again very nice if the normal bundle is trivial, then this is the classic, the canonical anomaly inflow mechanism is that classical variation of the bulk fails on the brain. So you had a symmetry, you introduce a brain, the brain breaks this symmetry, but the breaking is confined to the brain itself. But luckily the brain is anomalous by itself and so the two, two currents, two anomalous currents can actually just cancel out. Okay, there is just one little thing is that, okay, we generally should not assume that M-theory allows only trivial normal bundles, right? So the triviality of the normal bundle comes, notice that here when I am computing the anomaly on the brain, I am writing characteristic classes on the tangent bundle to, to W, which is the, the manifold, the submanifold in 11 dimensions. While the original coupling here is written in the space-time, okay? So if, if you do it with non-trivial normal bundle, when you are restricting the classes from the space-time to the world volume, you will be picking pieces which depend on the normal bundle. It's also not a big deal because you can go and actually be a little more careful about how you compute the anomaly on the world volume. There isn't much change about this, this chiral two form, but there is a big change about the fermions because the fermions do live in the non-trivial representation of SO5, so they are sections of the normal bundle. So you have to recalculate a little bit, and once you do, you, re you, you see that kind of magically pieces start cancelling out again, except for one very last piece. So you end up with a rather unpleasant surprise that the anomaly, which was the coupling, which was anyway undisputed because it's computed in string theory, but which was also very well working with the, with the inflow, in general case, has an extra piece which has to do with the uh, non-trivial normal bundle. So you have this P2 of n divided by 24, okay? Um, so where do we look for answers? And the answers are, well, I already kind of told you that the only interesting thing is this chern simons coupling, okay, in the 11-dimensional supergravity. So we should look at it a little closer. And you see, this chern simons coupling was having CGG. So you would think, look, C wedge X8 was okay, there is one delta function hidden inside. CGG is too many delta functions. This guy is somehow too singular. Let's try to, to make it a little bit more regular, okay? So what we do is we look for another representation of, of Tom class, which we can find uh, by, by writing this Poincaré dual to the brain in the following form, okay? We introduce a bump function, something which, so, you cut out a small disk around the brain and you, you look, uh, you define the radial direction away from it and then you can have some bump function, some profile, which interpolates, let's say, between minus one and zero. 
its derivative will, will be approximating a delta function as, as this bump function gets kind of steeper, okay? But the, the big point is to, 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 to make the formalism SO5 invariant, okay? So we introduce something which is called global angular form and, um, and okay, there is, there is a bit of dimensional dependence whether you, you do this procedure with the transverse dimensions which are odd or even, which has to do essentially with Euler class, Euler number of a sphere being either two or zero. Uh, and in the case that we are interested in, I mean our global angular form is E4 and it has to be closed, okay? And then there is a remarkable result by Cataneo and Bot, which kind of showed that cohomologically this global angular form squared is a pullback of some point, okay, it works for any n, but for case of n equal two, which means e4 square, is a pullback of p2 of n. Again, p2 is important here because that's, that was our uncancelled anomaly. And moreover, there is another formula is that when you take e4 cubed and you integrate along the fibers, you will get p2. Again, we have p2 and notice we have a cube. Charles Simon's coupling was cubic. Okay, so these, these are the ingredients. Okay, I show you the explicit expressions. I mean, they normally should follow from general kind of formalism, but in case you want to see the explicit expressions, they are, they are not really super hard to, to derive. Uh, in some ways, I mean, these this things very much are along the, the, the steps in Chern's proof of, of gauss bonnet theorem. Okay, I think he was constructing similar kind of objects. But roughly speaking, take a volume form. So why, why had think of it as stereographic coordinate? And the volume form will, be, will have epsilon a1 to a5 with five, four dy's and one y. Okay? And now take the derivatives and covariantize them. But that will make this guy non-closed, so you, you start adding terms in order to make it closed. Okay, simple. Uh, for low, I mean, you have general formula for any dimensions, but doing it for n equal two, just explicitly, is not very hard. Just to show it, we can also do a descent on it. So we can write it as d of some local expression, and we can calculate the variation. So everything we do, for kind of skeptical physicists, we can everything can be verified. All right, I'll skip you some of the steps. The important point is that eventually we can rewrite this equation with just simply saying, uh, you know, so we started with g equals dc and now we shift it around by something so that dg is no longer zero, okay? But somehow we can still preserve the chern simons form of it. So we do the shift in, in all three of them. And then if we do it and we can compute the variation, then you see, essentially what contributes here is this E cube. And E cube eventually gives us the P2 of N. The M cell reaction did not change. You just no. properly correctly yes. expanded it. Yes. It's yes. the same action, you just yes. correctly expanded it because right. there is a break. So the end result is this is the formula to retain. That the chern simons coupling in the presence of the brain when the non-trivial normal when there is a non-trivial normal bundle is no longer diffeomorphism invariant okay and its contribution should sum up and here is the importance of having zeros zeros are good indeed we want to sum things up in order to have a zero so we have the m5 anomaly what i call bulk is just this contribution from c wedge x8 and the contribution, the variation of chern simons they all uh, add up to zero. Okay, great, fantastic. So we saved M theory, it no longer suffers from anomalies, but I was telling you about ADS in the beginning of the talk, and then you could object that ADS would require large N. And what I'm doing is, notably I talked about anomaly of M5, I explicitly computed the polynomial, so I am actually talking about single brain. So you would ask, what does it mean, the anomaly, for multiple brains? A theory which has an ADE classification, a theory about which we know strictly nothing, okay? Other than the fact that it has 
AD classification. And here is a kind of a, a rare case in life when you are kind of lucky that you get almost out of nothing something which looks rather nice. You know, stare a little bit at this cancellation mechanism or long enough and then you say, look, if we replace one brain by many brains, there are two parts of this uh, formula which change very little. I mean, eventually everything was about dg equals something and now we, we stick a charge there. That's all that changes. And there doesn't seem to be anything else happening from the point of view of inflow. So why don't we assume that the mechanism still holds? If you assume it, then it's a very trivial calculation to show that an anomaly of Q coincident five brains, and this is the case of SUQ or UQ enh enhancement, will become Q times anomaly of the single five brain plus this P2 of n multiplied by Q cubed minus Q over 24. Okay? And then you try to test this formula in all possible cases, but essentially you just really got uh, a knowledge of anomalies uh, of two zero non-abelian theories with doing very, very little. Just simply requiring that M theory with the brains is not supposed to uh, suffer from anomalies. Okay? Now, in order to, to talk about A series, you have to take away the center of mass, which you can do, and the, the change is very little. Okay? Then a calculation has been done by replacing R5 by R5 mod Z2 or by sphere by RP4. Okay, it requires a bit of care, but you do get a formula. Okay, for, for D series. For E series, we do not have a brain realization, not at least that I know, but by now there is also a proof using five dimensional gate chain assignments theories, and it does confirm actually that there is a general pattern, that the coefficients always, always look the same way. Okay? Uh, and since then, I mean, this is about two zero theories. Since then, the things have been extended to, to also different one zero theories. The first step, for example, is to do the so-called E strings. And there, I mean, for the string theorists in the audience, I would like to remind you that there is another place where C wedge X8 and CGG play together very, very well to, to give us something. And that's the horjava witten mechanism. So if you look at the Green-Schwartz polynomial near a boundary, so I here is 1 or 2, 1 E8 or the other E8, it also has this remarkable form, that it's a four-form polynomial wedge X8, the very same X8 I was talking about, plus the cube of that polynomial. That's actually the, the original Witten's... This is Horja... Or as a four tangent one, okay. Right. No, this is Horjava Witten 2. So just deriving Green-Schwarz... When, when Wilton tried to cancel M5 very anomaly, could not explain in M5... Uh, the, the M he went to 2A. This is, hetero, this is heterotic, no. So this is just simply saying that the way to do to start getting into 1-0 theories is combining horjava witten with the, with the cancellation mechanism that I was describing above. Okay, and this way you start seeing 1-0s and then, of course, there are many more others than E strings, it gets a bit more complicated. Okay, now I put a transparency to make it sort of contact with Kumbrun's talk, which unfortunately are the parts where, which he didn't really cover. Okay, so he didn't talk about six dimensional one zero theories, but I will. Uh, so if you put the five, the M theory on a Calabiao uh, threefold, you will get five dimensional theory with eight supercharges. If the threefold in question is elliptically fibered, that theory lifts to six dimensional one zero theory. Okay? Now, if you pick one vector field in, the, in this five dimensional supergravity, then you see this looks very much similar to, to 11 dimensional supergravity where you replace the three form by a one form. So generically, there are couplings of this form with, again, 
just like what Kumrun was saying, a priori unfixed coefficients. Okay, so there is a kind of a five-dimensional Chern-Simons term, and then there is AUHP1, so it's a little lighter, kind of instead of an eight-form polynomial, you have just, just a P1, and just really doing variation of this, and assuming that there is some kind of charge source. Yeah, A is, is a billion. Then, then you, can, you can immediately see the relation of these coefficients to, to the brain anomalies. So there is, a, there is a chiral string living in this theory. The anomaly of this chiral string is given by the following form. It's very clear that only one sector knows, the n here is SO3 bundle or SU2, only one sector knows about it. So only C right knows about P1 of n or at all about normal bundle. Well, the, the tangent bundle has the difference, it just encodes the difference of central charges. So it immediately tells you that in order to have consistent supergravity, you better have quantized uh, coefficients. It also kind of bounds, you see, you have two extreme cases where alpha or beta is equal to zero. And then you can, you can see that there are, there are bounds between these things. This is realized in M theory, if you look at five brain, which is wrapping a very ample divisor, and in that case, you can express this alpha and beta in terms of intersection numbers of this divisor and the signature. Okay, these strings do not lift into strings in six dimensions, so the things that Kumbrun didn't talk about were not really exactly those things. They are slightly different in that they would have Q square there. Okay. But morally, you get the flavor, and again, if you had seen the formula with normal bundles and stuff, you would know where it's coming from, okay? Um, all right, uh, now I have a few minutes to talk about uh, gauge theories, but before I want to kind of introduce a formal object. So I want to say that from now on, what we will be doing, uh, we will be dealing with some kind of formal 12 form, which will be integrating down and sort of, okay, you probably saw the flavor of what's going to, to, to happen if I have this 12 form polynomial and it is defined in such a way that if I take the F M theory action and I vary it, I get some 10 form and that 10 form comes from this I12 via descent, okay? So it is a formal construct its motivation is to give via descent something which does agree with the variation of 11 dimensional action. And if we integrate this guy on a sphere, let's say if we are interested in six dimensional CFTs or another higher dimensional surface, if we are interested in lower dimensional theories. So what we want to know is, or what we want to uh, claim is that you, you should always get this zero, that the, the inflow should agree with the CFT uh, anomaly up to, up to decoupling modes, okay? So one example of this where things become non-trivial and also rather technical is, but in a way the very simplest one, is take this S4 and, and, and fiber it over, an, over a Riemann surface. And so in other words, what you have is you have a five brain wrapping a Riemann surface. Um, and this way you will be getting four dimensional theories. So preservation of supersymmetry tells you that SO5 can be broken either into SO2 times SO3 or SO2 times SO2. This is n equal two or n equal four case. But the basic idea always stays. So what so before I was showing you the formula with subscript eight and now it's the formula with subscript six that the in direct integration gives us an overall result for the anomaly of the CFT plus the decoupling mode. You look at the explicit examples, you want to compare with cases you know, and normally you find the perfect matching with kind of every single calculation which we have done. It does require special treatment. I mean, what you are interested generally is in Riemann surfaces with punctures and things like that. So, the bottom line is, it seems to work, okay? Now, um, all right, so here is an anomaly expression for a generic CFT, and here is somehow the identification that you get from the inflow, and once more. 
if you check it on examples, it does seem to check every time you can do the calculation. But there is a different, different things you can do here. That the anomaly is also equal, again, let's go back and think about the P2 of n, the P2 of the normal bundle. What we would be saying is that this six-dimensional 2-0 theory is also the singleton which lives on the boundary of ADS. So exactly the same calculation uh, or computing these anomalies is the same as computing Chern-Simons terms, in this case in seven-dimensional supergravity. So you would be asking seven-dimensional supergravity is a theory with 11-dimensional, is with two derivatives. You compactify somehow and you find a theory which has higher derivatives. It just Newton procedure gives you Chern Simons terms, you, it's not hard to count derivatives. A f cube. So it starts with three derivative terms. Okay. Where do these guys come from? Well, I mean, you, you just look at it and you say, okay, what our vacuum configuration was, was this that we took the, the flux and we said we equated it up to a charge Q to the volume of the S4. Okay. But now we should, we should excite, we should expand around the vacuum, but we should kind of stick to some rules. We, should, we want to stay invariant under SO5, we want it to be closed, we want it to be quantized. So again, you stare at list of properties and you say, oh, we know such an object. This was our friend, the global angular form. So if we, if we take it uh, and, and use it for kind of as an ansatz for excitation around the vacuum, actually it does give us the, the, the wanted Chern-Simons term with the wanted coefficients. And this was the, the calculation which is, let's say, the topological sector of the theory. And if you really want a full supergravity, you start moving into something which is a science of its own, which is called kind of consistent truncations, you have to incorporate the scalars. Okay? But in some ways, you also have a way of thinking about it because you are asking about the space of deformations of this global angular form. And then you can conclude that this is given by essentially a coset or by symmetric matrices. So it's an SL5 mod SO5 coset. And that's exactly the coset of the five dimensional super of the seven dimensional supergravity. And you can check this thing in the lower dimensional case. So if you have an E5, and that's ADS7 uh, type 2B on, AD, on S5, then you will be getting SL5 mod SO5 coset, but then the, the theory had also an SL2 to start with, and two together they build the exceptional group E6. And then if you do the, the, the seven sphere reductions, you see an SL8, which is a maximal subgroup of, of, of E7, the, the missing ingredients here are associated with the S7 being parallelizable. Okay? So in the rest of the talk what I will want to do is actually since I am just for now interested in anomalies to sort of say look cut it short and just go and compute the Chern-Simons couplings in the theories especially that given uh, that I, I know how to produce ADS5 uh, in many cases where I do not have kind of a direct brain interpretation so say, look, take all the geometries you know and you can control and try to compute the Chern-Simons coefficients. And that's essentially going to give you uh, the anomalies you want. So again, we have a list of properties. We know that G should be generally be replaced by some global angular form, sort of the, the our sphere has to be fibered over some space in order to uh, provide a bigger space on which we are compactifying the 11 dimensional theory. So we are always in a uh, situation like this. Uh, again, the list of properties of this E hasn't changed. I just made it capital. And the reason I did is because the general, these general manifolds are not spheres anymore. So they have more stuff there. What do they have? They have isometries. So there is some a priori non-abelian group of isometries. And then there are two forms which give rise also to vector fields. So I'm interested in four-dimensional vector fields, where I get vector fields. Notice that this is an ansatz taken by hand. 
if I had taken kind of other forms, presumably I should be getting towards the higher symmetries, which I suppose Zohar will be talking about. Okay, I'm not doing any of it here. Uh, uh, so if you do it, you can you can argue that the most general form of E4 is is the following where I have kind of joined together the isometry objects and the objects which are associated with harmonic two forms into a single object X. The, the superscript G means things are gauged, which means you take the differential forms that you would be writing otherwise, and every time that you would be writing dx, dy, or whatever, you replace them by appropriate covariant derivatives. There is an extra kind of subtlety that in d equal 4 one of these modes associated with the with the harmonic two forms becomes massive and so there is an extra constraint now the consist the, the closure and invariance of this e4 in this form <coughs> sums up to a bunch of unpleasant looking equations which however you just realize that okay if you introduce uh, an equivariant object so a four form which is homogeneous degree 4, but in such a way that you are adding differential forms plus 2 times the degree of the polynomial form of the objects which are valued in some Lie algebra, that all this invariance and closure end up just being uh, uh, a condition that the object defines an equivariant class, this E4. Okay? This is also a convenient object uh, language to analyze the deformations. So we do not want the things which are equivariantly exact. We just want the closed ones. So we want a, a cohomology which weeds out lots of redundancies of this E4, not completely. If you want to fix the, the ambiguities uh, completely, what we found a little bit by trial and error is that, OK, imposing the following condition, that this object is trivial in cohomology, uh, does the job and agrees with again all the known examples its moral motivation comes from the 11 dimensional supergravity equations of motion which says d star g4 equals g4 with g4 plus x8 once more you are replacing g's by e's but you notice that this object is trivial in cohomology so if you integrate it on any eight surface this better be zero okay um, so uh, Okay, I probably don't have that much time to talk about a particular example, which I was planning to do, uh, which, which is made of, uh, so the, the, there is a large class of geometries, um, which provide this suitable six manifold on which by compactifying the 11 dimensional theory, we get ADS5. And that is by having an S2 bundle over a product of S2 and the Riemann surface uh, um, uh, with uh, G holes, somehow things better work. They don't quite work for torus for the reason the, that there are accidental symmetries. So it's safer to take this a sphere, which is the best studied example. So the product of two spheres with a sphere bundle on top of just a, or just a, a higher genus Riemann surface. Okay. So you go through some steps, you, you look at the quantization, you figure out your redundancy, and again, we have uh, three-dimensional, three harmonic forms, but only two independent fields, and I chose an F2 and F3 to write my final result in, which ends up this. Okay, I don't imagine, or it wasn't for you to, to, to particularly appreciate it, it's just somehow to tell you that, okay, this simple, compact formula uh, in 11 dimensions, once you put them through the machinery, are able to produce stuff like this, okay? In order to figure out the central charges, you have to go through, through A maximization, you end up with, okay, equally cumbersome looking central charge, which this expression, however, at least we can check. So it has not been computed in generality, but for for the sphere and one particular flux being zero, we can, we can check that this does agree with the known results. Okay, so in principle, there is a potential insight that you can sort of handle cases which you couldn't do otherwise or haven't been done otherwise. Okay, 
So I am close to the end then. Uh, so what we hope is that, uh, well, once more, the chern simons couplings in the, in, the, in the ADS via holography give us kind of a direct access to, 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 to anomalies in superconformal theories. And the program which we have been kind of trying to develop is just kind of to systematize this computation and essentially we are seeing that everything is determined by, by the topology of the space and by some class E4. Um, and, and there is a class of theories which we cannot get in M theory but they require type 2B and there we kind of, there we are developing a similar formalism. Uh, notice that I mentioned that there is some kind of Z2 story here. The even uh, global forms and odd global forms behave very differently. So here for uh, the five sphere you will need E5 and E5 is not closed. Okay. And then there is extra complications having to do with self-duality. Um, but in principle we can define an equivalent or analog of this class I12, which will be a class I11 for type 2B theory which again seems to give, seems to allow us to do calculations. One, I mean, there are many questions one could ask, things about discrete symmetries, higher symmetries, and also kind of uh, doing a more systematic calculations which take us beyond these topological limits and actually construction of real physical theories in terms of supergravities. And in some ways, maybe one could actually try to think again, going back to Kumbrun's work, uh, not a question which has been asked, but possibly that, uh, for example, the good match of discrete symmetries and higher symmetries might start imposing constraints on ADS, on ADS uh, theories, which we have not seen before. So that if there is uh, any kind of swampland also in the ADS context. Uh, but okay, these are dreams for the moment only, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, this mysterious 12 class that you showed in the talk, could you say some more words on it, right? You, you said it's a formal construction, but what, what do you think it is, right, this 12 form? Well, again, the inspiration comes from the fact that when you have, I mean, from like Vesumino models, you have CGG, of course you can think of 11-dimensional theory as a boundary of some 12-dimensional world and then you would be just dealing with GGG. Actually I was dealing with E4 cube throughout so that's the, that's the basic underlying idea. But once more, it was just simply constructed as something whose descent gives us the variation of the 11 dimensional action. For the general like P form fields, do you know the boundary conditions in ADS? No. So it's not fixed by this construction? We, we haven't tried yet. I mean, we start thinking about it, so maybe ask me in a while and hopefully I'll tell you something about it. Why do you think it's not fixed by this construction? Well, for instance, in ADS 5 times S5 there are many options. Right. Yeah. You can have the... You can have PSU and gauge theory, SU and gauge theory, U and gauge theory, and they correspond oh, to different choices theory. of the boundary conditions of the two form gauge fields. Yeah. So I think it would be an interesting thing to kind of through put that through this machinery and see if, see if there are any constraints. Thank you. Thank you.